Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number two, titled Off the Bus. Off the Bus is a story from my adolescent years. The collection of stories I have written and am reading to you cover many subcultures in our country that I have interacted with from my childhood to my adult and senior years. A more extensive introduction to the Finding My Way stories takes place in the beginning of Podcast One. Regardless of which podcasts you are listening to, you will find the story both entertaining and worthy of your reflective thoughts concerning its contents. The stories, as a collection, provide insights into a span of time that has played a role in shaping American culture and influencing its future. The stories provide you with a sense of admiration for the culture's collective courage in our country's commitment to justice and its optimistic willingness to address new challenges. Off the bus. Right off, she started out on the wrong foot. As the ten or so of us boarded the Racine County school bus that cold October morning in 1957, there was the usual horseplay among the boys. We were a mix of junior high school and senior high school students isolated by an hour drive from Goodview subdivision to our destination, Horlick High School in Racine, Wisconsin. Mark had a few snot gobs hanging on the back of his coat that he didn't know about. Susie screamed that someone had just tried to goose her and then burst into laughter. You know, it was just another of those typical good view getting on the bus mornings. You people had better start behaving, she shouted at us with an angry stare flowing from the large rear view mirror hanging over her head. I've had it with your smart aleck sassiness. You're going to behave like young adults or you're not going to be on this bus much longer. Ooh, what a bitch. Whore, your days are numbered on this bus, lady. These were just a few of the catcalls I could catch from the crowded bus. The uproar was massive. She had just stirred up a hornet's nest. The like of which she could not imagine, was my take of the situation. Our collection of kids from Goodview was not those that responded favorably to angry words from an adult telling them to act like ladies and gentlemen. The group pride ran in the direction of being the baddest of the bad. There was a collective pride in the fact that almost all of the guys had spent time in prison. The word was that there were only about three or four of us who had never been arrested. I was one of those three or four, as was poor Mark, the guy with the snot gobs on the back of his coat. Several of us felt bad that Mark was picked on that way, He was a quiet enough guy who always smiled when anyone spoke to him. Where there was a gathering, you'd usually find Mark. He never participated in any bad behavior or caused anyone grief. He was just there with that pleasant puppy dog smile. He'd help you out if you dropped some books or needed someone to go back to the makeshift baseball field to get a glove that had been forgotten. He was an all-around nice guy. Everyone agreed on that point. When you could, you looked out for him. Waiting at the bus stop in the morning was not a time to look out for anyone but yourself. You had to be on guard to respond just as soon as someone get became ready to reach for your chest, to twist your shirt front, to cause it 
to look as if you had a nipple pushing out. They'd actually grab your nipple under your shirt and twist it as well if they were lucky enough to get a good hold through your coat, your shirt, and your t-shirt. Of course, giving your nipple a good twist happened more in the early fall and then in the spring. Naturally, you had to be on the lookout for someone spitting a hawker close to your coat. To let that go unchallenged with a return hawker closer to your assailant's coat than he was to yours was an open invitation for the back of your coat to end up like Mark's. Those mornings at the bus stop required so much alertness on my part to protect myself that looking out for Mark then was just out of the question. My first year as a member of the 50 or so boys riding the school bus from Goodview to my ninth grade school, it taught me how to maintain my own space from all of the bullying that took place. Goodview was not a happy place for someone who did not stand up for himself. This first semester as a 10th grader, my first year in a real high school, my fellow occupants on the bus didn't intimidate me. I had established that I could and would stand up for myself. I was respected by my peers, not because I'd been in jail, I hadn't. Not because I was the best fighter or the best athlete, I wasn't. But because I had grit. I would stand up for myself even when I and everyone else knew I would lose. I never picked on anyone. I always tried to be kind when the opportunity presented itself. And I was often a loner. My chief entertainment was being in the woods and attending Boy Scout activities. I knew that to spend much time with these guys was to get into trouble. I had no desire to rob a grocery store, break out someone's window because they had made me mad, or to become overly committed to winning some group game. Now, that's how I saw myself with these guys. I'm not really sure how they actually saw me. I doubt that I will ever know that. She stopped the bus in the middle of the two-lane road. You are all out of control. You just stop this. You just stop this right now. I will not be insulted. Not one more time. I've had it with you. Every one of you. For a few seconds, there was silence on the bus. With a slight smirk, as if she thought she had won. The lady driver sat back in her seat and started the bus. Just past my ear, flying up the aisle, went a balled up sandwich. It smacked into the front windshield just to the right of her face. It seemed to have been a great jelly sandwich. It stuck to the window before sliding down. A huge burst of laughter and anger erupted from the two-thirds of the bus to my rear. The gates to the dam had been opened. Bananas, water-soaked napkins, cookies, and a host of other objects flew to the front of the bus. It was clear that there was a collective objective. It was not to hit the lady bus driver, but to come as close to hitting her as the assailants could. They were successful. Her terrified face in the rearview mirror served as all the re reinforcement the kids needed to continue the barrage. The laughter filled the bus as missile after missile was launched toward the front. I did not participate, of course. I did chuckle at the absurdity of it all. Looking back at the guys, there were several who paralleled my response to the outlandish eruption of rebellion. We were not participants in this assault. We didn't throw anything or shout insults at the lady. No one on the bus expected me or the other non-combatants to join in. 
It was just that the aggressive ones were predictably being themselves. They were having fun. And those that were having the fun didn't mind if other fun lovers wanted to join in. That was all. Clearly, from their perspective, he was getting a little revenge while having fun on the adult, the lady bus driver, who had just unjustly treated them. After all, she had prov provoked them. She had asked for it. Yes, she had used the wrong way of trying to calm this group down. I could have told her that yelling at the group and telling them to behave would not work. Not only would it not work, but it would produce the opposite behavior she wanted the kids to display. However, like most of adults of our day, she didn't want to hear what the kids had to say. She just wanted us to obey and follow her orders the way she wanted them to be followed. Maybe that worked with the good children of Racine, but it would never work with those from good view. The onslaught of food thrown towards the lady fairly quickly came to an end. She had been silent after those last confrontational words. Her silence enabled her to stop reinforcing the behavior. The fact that there were pro probably wasn't much more ammunition available had to have been a contributing factor. The onslaught of food thrown towards the lady fairly quickly came to an end. She had been silent after those last confrontational words. Her silence enabled her to stop reinforcing the behavior. The fact that there probably wasn't much more ammunition available had to have been a contributing factor. The ride back from this high school to our bus stop in Goodview had to be hell for the lady bus driver. She glared at each of us as we boarded the bus at the end of the school day. Several of the guys and some of the girls mumbled curses at her as they passed by her seat. Bitch, ugly cow, whore. The bus driver didn't respond. She just glared at all of us. Once we were a few minutes down the road, it seemed the kids finally forgot about her. There was the usual horseplay going on between John and Lance. Some girls were flirting with a couple of guys. Henry was starting to do his homework. He always did that on the trip back. I was engaged in talking with an acquaintance about something that had happened during the rehearsal for the play I was in. My teacher was having me be a reporter giving made-up news broadcasts to anyone who would listen during the lunch hour in the school cafeteria. I was a co-star. It was a funny show. I hope the high school kids liked it. As my group was getting off the bus, the driver said, You're going to be sorry for your behavior. I've called the police. Whoa, whoa, was the cry from several in our collection of students. It took a while for all of us to get off of the bus at this particular spot. A lot of us lived on this street or on nearby ones. I was walking by the rear of the school bus. I noticed someone on the other side of it wedge a metal spike between one of the double rear tires and the asphalt. When the bus pulled out, that spike would puncture the tire. I looked away. I knew not to be a part of this act of revenge. Well, I thought I'd hear a loud explosion as the tire was punctured. Nothing happened. The bus just drove on. I didn't see the tire go suddenly flat. A few of the boys and girls walking my way had seen this event unfold. We all looked at one another and shrugged. 
nothing happens as you expect it to. The next morning found us all together at the bus stop as usual. It was like all the other cold, dark mornings with shoulders being punched, snot being spit, and laughter mixed into conversations. The bus pulled up. There was a new bus driver and some man standing at the door of the bus with his hand held up to stop us. Only the girls are allowed on the bus. What? How are we going to get to school? That's your problem. Only the girls. Come on, girls, get on. They filed in. All of the guys were left by the side of the road. There was nowhere for us to go but back to our houses. I told my mom what had happened. She tried to call the school. All of the lines were busy. She was mad. She drove me to school. I was one of the few guys from Goodview Subdivision attending school that day. Nothing was said to me about not being able to ride the bus to school. It seemed to be a normal day of classes. When my mom picked me up from school that afternoon, she asked me what I had heard about the bus situation. I hadn't heard anything. No one brought it up. She said the school had called her. They told her about the boys assaulting the bus driver and destroying something on the bus. The boys from the subdivision were not allowed to ride the school bus again. There was supposed to be an announcement about it on TV that evening. Before supper, the two sisters from the end of our street were walking by. I went outside and asked them what they had heard. They said all the guys were banned from riding the bus because of what had happened the day before. It wasn't fair, they said, because most of the guys didn't do anything. Well, I could have argued that at least half of them did throw something, even though I hadn't seen more than a couple of guys tossing things because I was seated so close to the front of the bus. I let the point pass without contradiction. No one knew when we would ever be allowed back on the bus. The girls said they had gotten back at the system for being so unfair. Between riding to school in the morning on the bus and riding back home that afternoon, they had removed all of the screws they could from inside the bus. They had used their fingernail files as screwdrivers. At some point, someone would discover that all of the seats wouldn't stay on their metal frames. Lots of the windows wouldn't work, and the side panels would fall off. They were pretty proud of their handiwork. I didn't see the governor tell the state of Wisconsin about us. I was doing homework in my room. The two sisters told me that he said that all of the boys from Goodview Subdivision were juvenile hoodlums who were all failing in school, destroyed school property, cut out of school more often than they intended, and were a disgrace to the state. Well, John and Lance were the only two guys I knew who had destroyed school property. A few weeks ago, John pointed out to me where he had carved Fuck You Horlick into the beautiful wood planks that divided the marble walls from the higher stucco wall that went to the ceiling. John was one of the few people in school, if not the only one tall enough to have reached that high to do the damage. Both John and Lance thought that what he had done was really funny. Lance went on to tell me that while John was doing that, he stuffed a bunch of paper towels and stuff in a trash can in the bathroom and set it on fire. They both laughed at that one. I shook my head at them and said they were crazy. They thought that was funny, too. While driving me to school for the second morning, my mom told me that next week there was going to be a big meeting for the parents of all us boys. 
I could come to the meeting if I wanted to. I declined the offer. I would be embarrassed to sit there while my mother vented her anger at this unjust act. There was no telling what she would say. Well, the whole process was really upsetting. It was a big bother for my mother to drive me to school. She had to deal with the babysitter for my baby brother, get my other brother off to elementary school, drive my dad to work when he was in town, and then go to work after dropping me off. I was sorry for all this trouble. There was nothing I could do about it. One of those no-bus-bad mornings, my biology teacher asked me to stay in the classroom after the other students had left. It was the class just before lunch, so it was okay for me to stay. I'm concerned about your homework. It seems to have gone down some over the last few days. What's going on? This is terribly embarrassing. I had straight A's in all of my assignments and all of my test papers for biology so far. This was my best school year ever. I had A's in all of my classes except algebra. I mean, there was nothing to do but study in the evenings at home. It was so boring. There was just one TV station we could pick up in the isolated Good View subdivision of Wisconsin. At night, the only radio signal that got through was some country music station out of Nashville, Tennessee, of all places. It played something called the Grand Old Opry. There was no rock and roll music to be heard. You couldn't hang out with the kids in the neighborhood. That would get you in jail. All there was to do was to study. That's what I had been doing. As I said, it was boring. I got kicked off the bus. They wouldn't let us boys ride the bus, I said, looking hard at the floor. I, I didn't realize you were involved in that. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. It must be hard on you and your family. I burst into tears. It was hard. I didn't know what to do to make it better. I was embarrassed. A, a guy wasn't to cry in front of a teacher. My, my tears wouldn't stop. She leaned over and gave me an awkward hug, patting me on the back. Oh, this was terrible. As quickly as I could, I regained some degree of self-control. She handed me a Kleenex to wipe my face. Thank you and her. I used it. You know, she said in a soft voice, the administration wants to know who the ringleaders were. It would help the situation be resolved if they knew who the leaders were. You could tell them. I can't do that, I shouted through my flow of tears. You, you don't understand what would happen to my family. My younger brother would be beat up. The windows in our house would be busted out, our car windows too. The garbage cans would be thrown all over the yard. That would be just the beginning. I can't tell on anybody that... There's no protection. There's no protection for what they would do. All right. All right, then. Just, just think about it. Just know that I'm here for you. As I walked to the cafeteria, I thought, she doesn't have a clue about what, what life is like in the subdivision. None of them do. Anyway, I really don't know who the ringleaders were. I seriously doubt that there was a ringleader. It was just a, a happening. It just happened, that's all. One thing was for sure. I wasn't about to tell my parents what the biology teacher had said. They would be angry. I certainly couldn't tell any of the kids. This just didn't happen. Hey, your mom really gave him a nearful at that meeting last night. She said a lot of good things about you. Is it true that you have just about straight A's? Yeah. 
I was embarrassed. She said you had won awards and things at other schools you went to and all. I didn't know that, the sister from down the street said, as if a questioning kind of uh, rolled around in the back of her head. I wasn't going to verify her comments. I wanted the conversation to change. What'd they say about getting back on the bus? They, they said that they would have to go back and check the school records on you and some other kids before they made a decision. A few more days of this painful transportation system passed when I got a word from one of the sisters. Hey, did you hear? Hear what? They kept questioning everyone about who the ringleader was. They called Mark in and questioned him. Mark confessed. He said he was the one who started it all. They've arrested him already. He's in jail. What? That's crazy. He didn't do anything. He, he's not a leader of anything. Yeah, that's what we all said too. It's crazy. Why would he want to confess? He never did anything bad like that. It's crazy, isn't it? Poor Mark. I felt so sorry for him. It just didn't make sense. He was the one who collected hawkers on the back of his coat. I've thought a lot about that confession. It's so hard to understand. A few days later, we are allowed back on the bus. Not much was said about it. Someone said that someone from the governor's office got on TV and apologized to the community. I don't know if that was true. If an apology was made, I don't know what was said in it. My dad was being transferred. During Christmas break, we moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania.